James Webb finds the smallest asteroid ever seen in the main belt. Astronomers double the chances of that asteroid strike in 2032 using hydrogel to protect astronauts from radiation. And material from Alpha Centauri is already streaming into the solar system. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. James Webb is an absolute powerhouse of space telescopes, 6.5 meters out at the L2 Earth-Sun Lagrange point, and it is giving us this exquisite view right back to the earliest times in the universe. It is peering through gas and dust to see newly forming planets, and it is giving us our best view of exoplanet atmospheres. But also, it can look at stuff here in the solar system by accident, sort of. So astronomers were using James Webb to observe the atmospheres of the exoplanets in the TRAPPIST-1 system. And the astronomers behind this knew that there was a lot of additional useful information that was in the field of view while they were spending dozens of hours watching these exoplanets. So they developed a machine learning algorithm that allows them to examine the field of view and spot if anything is moving through it like an asteroid. And so back when they were doing their observations of the TRAPPIST-1 system in 2022 and 2023, they had 90 hours that they were doing these observations. And from that, in addition to not finding atmospheres on the planets yet, maybe we'll see, they also were able to find eight known asteroids in the asteroid belt and 139 unknown asteroids in the belt. Now, the largest of these is several soccer stadiums across, but the smallest is down to about the size of a school bus, like 10 meters long. Now we can see 10 meter asteroids when they are coming very close to the earth. We get these flybys and people find these small asteroids sometimes just before they're about to hit planet earth. But to see an asteroid this small all the way out to the asteroid belt, which is several times the distance of the earth to the sun away from us, is really impressive. And the astronomers think that if they actually did dedicated observing campaigns, they could find even more. And so it could very well be that there are just thousands of these asteroids that could be found by looking through existing observations from James Webb. Now, one of the researchers behind this is Julian DeWitt, and I actually did a great interview with him about exoplanets, but you can sort of see how his mind works uh, as ways to get even more science done when using James Webb. And speaking of asteroids, last week, I let you know about the asteroid 2024 YR4, which at that point, astronomers had estimated there was a 1% chance of it striking the Earth in 2032. And then like as we had released the video, we got a new estimation that had come out from the astronomers and they had upped the chances to 2.3% in 2032. That's like twice as much. And you know, that might sound a little scary, but again, like I said last week, I'm gonna say this week, do not panic. Uh, this is very normal for them to find these asteroids and for them to grow in the chances that they're going to hit us. And then more observations come on board and then people are able to reduce that uncertainty down to zero. So it still is a three on the Torino scale, but we are expecting that upcoming observations are going to reduce that uncertainty and it'll probably be very safe. And then speaking of James Webb and asteroids, in fact, the European Space Agency and NASA announced that James Webb is going to be joining the observations of 2024 YR4. And so probably in March, they're going to be using the telescope to observe YR4 and give some of the best measurements because asteroids are fairly difficult to spot. They are dark. They don't reflect a lot of the sun's light, but in the infrared, that's when they're easy to see. In fact, all of the best asteroid hunting observatories, the plans for telescopes, those are all gonna be infrared telescopes. And so you get this radiating heat coming off these asteroids, that's the kind of thing that James Webb is going to be able to see. And so we should get the most accurate measurements of YR4, thanks to James Webb. And then sort of to relate back to those original observations of asteroids in the main belt done accidentally. And so this all just comes together in a really nice 
tidy bow. Even though it's probable that the chances of YR4 hitting Earth are going to go down over time, the European Space Agency and the Chinese Space Agency are taking this very seriously. Both have independently put together groups to study what kind of a mission it would take to be able to rendezvous with YR4, maybe do an impact to try and push it out of the way or an orbiter to join it. Because when asteroids come really close to the Earth, there's a really great science opportunity to understand because they're going to experience this gravitational tug as they go really close to the Earth. This is going to deform them. This is going to change their orbit. And it's that change in orbit that will tell astronomers about what it's made of, how it does it have open spaces inside of it? What is its composition? And so this is similar to a flyby that's being done with the OSIRIS-REx mission that it's going to be joining up with asteroid Apophis during its flyby of Earth. And that will give us a lot more information about how asteroids are composed. So hopefully, even if this asteroid is completely safe, it's a great opportunity to do a flyby of an asteroid while it's doing a flyby of the Earth. Newly forming planets seen by Webb. Now I've reported on the PDS 70 system several times in the past. And this is one of the closest best examples of a newly forming planetary system. You've got a young star probably less than a million years old, and it has an accretion disk of material that is surrounding it. And this image that you're looking at, this isn't like an artist's creation, this is an actual infrared photograph of the PDS 70 system. And we've seen some great images that have been taken by Earth based observatories. And now we've got newer images that were taken by James Webb. And of course, James Webb's an infrared telescope can see through the gas and dust and reveal regions inside this newly forming system. And it's been able to pin down the locations of two planets with more accuracy than has ever been seen before. And what makes this even more fascinating is that the two planets are surrounded by clouds of dust. And it's believed that these are the inflows of material where the two planets are siphoning in material from this accretion disk that is surrounding the star. And so it's absolutely incredible that we can watch this brand new star system and its planets coming together almost in real time protecting astronauts with hydrogel. Radiation is one of the main challenges for deep space exploration. Once you leave the Earth's protective magnetosphere, you're going to expose yourself to both radiation coming from the sun, solar storms, things like that, but also the more dangerous cosmic rays. And these can go through your tissue, strip electrons out of your atoms, and cause damage to your DNA that can then give you a higher likelihood of cancer down the road. When you're away from the Earth, you're experiencing about 200 times the radiation load than you would experience down on the Earth. To protect yourself from radiation, you want to surround yourself with protons, you want to use rock, regolith, or water. Water is actually a surprisingly good protector against radiation. But the problem with water is that it is very hard to work with in microgravity, it floats around. And so researchers in Europe have figured out a way to 3d print hydrogel Now, hydrogel, this is this stuff that's used in diapers, um, but it will absorb about 100 times its own weight in water and yet still keep its shape. And then you can imagine these would be installed inside a spacecraft or inside a habitat and then just add water. And then as you add the water, you get this flexible membrane that holds itself together that locks in the water. So it doesn't try to float around inside your spacecraft. And so we can imagine in the future, you'll have some spacecraft, it's going to have the hydrogel built into the spacecraft, it's going to reach its first destination, maybe some comet or asteroid, it's going to bring in water on board, it's going to then turn that into these radiation plating that can then protect the astronauts for a long duration spaceflight. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best space news of the week and the winner this week was the <laughs> the chances that an asteroid is going to hit the Earth in 2032. So thank you everybody who voted. Now we put the vote into the post tab on our channel within about 24 hours of when we post our new video. So you can go in there and you can vote on that. But the best chance is if you subscribe to the channel, click on the notifications bell, click a bunch of the votes, and then the algorithm will learn and show you more of this voting. And then we can count up all the votes and celebrate next week.
Material from Alpha Centauri is already here. The closest stellar system to the solar system is the Alpha Centauri Proxima Centauri system. So you've got these two stars that are kind of like the sun that are orbiting around each other, and then a third red dwarf star that is orbiting around them. And you might not know, but Alpha Centauri is moving in our general direction at about 22 kilometers per second. And in about 25,000 years from now, it's going to get to the closest point to us. Although still, it's going to be about three light years away from us and then fly back off into the Milky Way. But like the solar system, like the sun, Alpha Centauri is a more mature, older system. It's about 5 billion years old. And this is a long time for these stars have been around. They've been influencing each other, rotating around, Proxima Centauri is going around them, and this has jiggled up their version of the Oort cloud. And so astronomers calculated that material from Alpha Centauri has been streaming in our general direction for probably millions of years. And so they did the math and sort of calculated how much perturbations are causing, how much, how much mixing up are these stars doing. And they estimate that there are probably more than 1 million objects in the solar system that have been ejected from Alpha Centauri that are bigger than 100 kilometers across. And now that's going to sound like a, just a mind bendingly large amount of material that is from Alpha Centauri. And yet, you know, it's estimated that the Oort cloud alone contains 10s of trillions to hundreds of trillions of objects that size. And so it's just a drop in the bucket. And in fact, they estimate that the chances of there being an object from Alpha Centauri within, say, 10 astronomical units of the sun is probably one in a million. And so there's countless objects from Alpha Centauri in the solar system. And yet probably we will never find them. Dark matter dominated the early universe. We see the effects of dark matter all around us in the rotation curves of galaxies in the distribution of material across the universe, even in the cosmic microwave background. And now astronomers have found some of the similar effects early on in the universe within the first billion years or so of the formation of the cosmos. So the piece of science that I want to really focus on here is called the rotation curve of galaxies. And this is where when you observe a galaxy, you observe the speed that the stars are going around the center of the galaxy when they're very close to the center, close to the supermassive black hole, they're going very quickly. But then there is this point where they slow down in their orbital speed, and then it remains constant all the way out to the outskirts of the galaxy. That's very different from what you would expect if there wasn't dark matter, say in the solar system, Mercury is going 48 kilometers per second around the sun, while Neptune is going five kilometers per second around the sun. Big difference, you don't get that, that constant speed, you get this steady drop off. And so that same effect that galaxy rotation has now been seen early on in the universe. But astronomers have watched how gas is flowing around the center of actively feeding supermassive black holes at the hearts of two galaxies. And so they're able to measure the velocity of the gases moving around these supermassive black holes at different distances. And they calculate that the dark matter accounts for about 60% of the mass of the galaxies themselves, which is a sort of different ratio than what we see in the universe today, but still that same effect. Now, you know, I like to give you some cool images, which we can express nicely in a video medium. So first, this is a video of noctilucent clouds on Mars seen by the Curiosity rover. And these are very high altitude clouds of carbon dioxide that can be seen shortly after sunset. And we can see these here on Earth as well, although they're not made of carbon dioxide. And then over the night, they cool down, they come down lower in altitude, and then they go up again when the temperatures warm up. And you can see these notches that are taken out of the picture. And this is because one of the color filter wheels on the Curiosity rover has failed. And so it's not able to produce the sort of complete image, it's missing some chunks. Next up, we've got an Einstein ring seen from ESA's Euclid mission. And Einstein rings are amazing because you've got this foreground galaxy cluster. In this case, it's about 600 million light years away. And then it is acting as a natural telescope lens for a more distant object. And in this case, the distant object is 4.43 billion light years away. And because they're aligned so perfectly, the light from the distant object comes wraps around this foreground galaxy 
perfectly and you get this ring around the center of it. And they're fairly rare and they're very useful both to understand the foreground galaxy and as a natural telescope lens to examine the background galaxy. And what's kind of amazing is that the Euclid mission is expected to find 100,000 of these Einstein rings out there across the cosmos once it completes its full survey. And finally, I want to show you an image of a star forming region called RCW 38. And this was captured by the European Southern Observatory's Vista instrument at its Paranel Observatory. And this is just like your classic example of a star forming region where you've got about 2000 stars that are less than a million years old, they're surrounded by gas and dust, stuff that would be obscured in visible light, but because the Vista instrument is infrared is able to see through that gas and dust and reveal all of these stars forming and all these clouds around them. So it's just a beautiful picture and a glimpse at what our own stellar nebula might have looked like four and a half billion years ago. Now you're watching this week's episode of Space Bites, but I am writing my weekly guide to space newsletter. This is where I take all of the rest of the stories that we didn't cover here and put this into an email. It goes out to 70,000 people. I write every word. There's no ads. Here's some examples of the stories. Uranus's moon Ariel has deep gashes that could reveal its interior. Europa Clipper tests its star tracker navigation system and space junk could re enter the atmosphere in busy flight areas. So if you want to sign up for the newsletter, go to universe today.com slash newsletter to sign up. Have you ever wondered if hyper velocity stars could have exoplanets? Well, astronomers think they found one. And this is a bonus story that we have available over on our Patreon channel. I can talk a little bit more about this. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Barry Lake Roofing, David Giltonet, David Matz, Dustin Cable, Greg Feely, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Michael Purcell, Paul Robach, Sean Sargent, Spiderswap.io, Stephen Father Munley, Thomas L. Scadron, and Vlad Shiblin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So I mentioned that bonus story earlier on in the episode. And this is a new thing that we are adding. And this is, you know, thanks to the patrons who are helping us support and create and do all of this reporting every week and pay the salaries of everybody involved, we were able to create more content. And so we've now got longer versions with more stories of all of our content that we are putting over on Patreon. It's the same episode of Space Bites, but with more. So if you want to go and watch that, we're going to put every single episode that we do both here and on Patreon, but the Patreon ones will be longer and better. And so all you have to do is go over and watch our content over on Patreon. And people ask me, what is the best way to support the work you do if you can't support us on Patreon? Well, the answer is watch it over on Patreon, because we have the ability to send you notifications of when we are releasing new stuff. And we're not dependent on the YouTube algorithm to either be smiling upon us or not smiling upon us and people will not hear about our content because now YouTube wants to focus on shorts. So if you want to watch that additional material and you don't have to sign in, you don't have to follow us, you don't have to give us any money, you can just watch those episodes without ads with additional content over on Patreon. All right, we'll see you next week.